is I went to live in Mali for two years and I worked in a small village there. So you guys study Mali in the third grade. So Miss Alexander and Miss Lucas invited me to come and talk to your class today about what Mali's like. Now you guys study ancient Mali, right? Yeah. So who knows what the word ancient means? It means a long time ago. It means a long time ago. Yeah, it means a long time ago. So this is maybe a, not a good question to ask, but am I ancient? No. 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 Ancient, ancient in Mali means like 800 years ago. This, yeah. The stuff that you guys study about Mali happened 800 years ago. So I didn't live in Mali 800 years ago. I lived in Mali like 30 years ago, which is still pretty long ago. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about my experiences and what I know about ancient Mali, okay? All right, you can go ahead. All right, so first we have to figure out where is Mali? Who knows what continent? Please raise your hand. What continent is Mali on? Africa, yeah. And is Africa over here? No, is Africa over here? No, no. no. It's, it's right there. there. It's right here, right? Here's Africa, right here. All right, next one. So this is the continent of Africa, and there are many, many, many countries on the continent of Africa. Looking at this map of Africa, who knows what color Mali is? Don't guess, raise your hand. Who knows? Well, nobody has any idea. All right, it's this orange one right here. Okay, you see that crazy looking country right there? Yeah, it looks kind of like Pac-Man, doesn't it, right? And so yeah, that is the country of Mali. So ancient Mali was a little bit different. The boundaries were a little bit different. So right here, this orange spot right here, you can see these are the boundaries of the ancient empire of Mali, okay? There's a river that runs through this part of Africa called the Niger River. Ni, and then the word air with a j on the beginning, Niger River. And the Niger River starts here in Guinea and it flows all the way up to Timbuktu. I've been there and all the way back down here and out of Lagos, Nigeria, okay? Now, ancient Mali was part of modern-day Mali, part of um, Senegal and Gambia and Guinea, and um, also a little bit of Burkina Faso and Niger over here on the edge. Next one. And this part of Mali is all the Sahara Desert in the top. So you see there's not many towns up here. Pretty hard to live in the Sahara because there's very, very little water in the desert. So most of the towns in Mali are in the southern part. And this little purple spot right here was where I lived. Next one. And there I am in my village 30 years ago. I was the only white kid there. And most people there had never seen somebody with white skin or hair on their arms or long stringy hair like mine. And so the kids were always touching me and feeling my hair and asking me to open my mouth and look inside and checking out my fingernails because I looked so different than they did. And they weren't used to it. And they weren't used to it, yeah. Sometimes I would go to different villages. Once they did get used to me in my village, if I went to a new village, sometimes all the kids would run screaming and crying to their mom when they saw me because they were so afraid. I'm not pretty, I'm not very scary, am I? No, no. But they've never seen anybody that looked like me, so they were scared. All right, next one. So this is my little village of Coca Joe. And Joe actually means wall and coco means to build or i got that backwards joe means to stand up to build and coco is a wall so this means to build a wall and the cool thing the reason why my village is named coco joe 
is because the original boundaries of ancient, the ancient Malian Empire, went really close to my village. And I got to go and see the wall that used to surround the ancient empire of Mali. It was 800 years old. Now, it didn't look like much of a wall. It was basically just this long bump that went in a line. <laughs> because years and years ago, just like today in Mali, they make their walls out of mud bricks. And so years and years of rain, those mud bricks just kind of melt, melt back into the ground. But this is my wall. And I lived in a cute little house. There's my little house. I didn't have any running water or electricity in my house. So I woke up in the morning when it got light outside and I went to bed at night when it got dark outside. Now I had lanterns and candles and a flashlight and stuff like that. But most of the time, if it was dark, I was sleeping. And if it was light, I was working outside. Now, over here on this side, you can see another little room. It did not have a roof. That was my bathroom. And then one side was my toilet. And on the other side was just another space where I could take a shower. And the way I took a shower was with a bucket of water. And this was in my chair. So I'd put that in the water and I'd pour it over my head. <laughs> and then I would soap up and then I'd put it in the water, put it over my head. Put that's the one you laugh over my head. And that's how I took a shower. Yeah. All right, one. next one. Well, one back. That's okay. So this is where I got my water. This was a well that actually has a little foot pump. I'll show you in a second. And I could go there with my buckets and fill up my buckets of nice, clean, fresh water that I could drink and use to bathe with. So next one. So here's me in Mali, pumping my water. You'd stand up on this little thing and you'd jump up and down on this little pedal and the water would come out of the spigot into your bucket. Now one thing you'll see, these are a lot of ladies, and this is my um, host mom, Khadija, who was always teasing me. Everything I did, I did it wrong, but she was always correcting me and trying to, to get me to do stuff her way, just like a mother. <laughs> And so here's another mama, and you can see she has a baby on her back. So I wanted to show you guys how the women wear their kids, like clothes, they wear their kids. And that's because they have to do all their work with their hands. And so they can't always be holding a baby. And they don't have strollers and car seats there. So they wear their kids. So let's say this is my baby, and he's sitting there, He's sitting there on the floor playing. And I'm like, come on, buddy. They pick him up by their shoulder and one arm and fling him up on their backs. And the little babies just lay there. And they know to lay there and not wiggle around. Because if they wiggle around, what's gonna happen? That's right. So mama lays the baby. Bunny's not gonna sit. Mama lays the baby up there. And then she takes a little piece of fabric. This is a fancy one, but most people just use any old thing they have. And they put it around the baby's back, and then they squeeze them in real tight. <laughs> and then they fold it over like this, and pull it up like this, and wrap it around, and tuck it under. And now they go. Is his head sticking out? No. They usually have their heads sticking out so they can breathe. <laughs> if the babies are really little, sometimes the head is tucked in to, stick, to keep their neck safe. But when they're a big kid, this is how they rock. And then mama can do whatever she needs to do. And she has her baby protected on her back. And she also has her hands free to do work. Okay, all right, next one. Now, the women do a lot of work in Mali. They get up before the sun comes up and start cooking because they have to cook three meals a day for their families and their families are very big. So they need to do a lot of cooking. This is my friend, my Muna. And she was one of the best cooks in my village. So sometimes at night, I would go down to her house and I would sniff and find out what she was making and then I would 
eat whatever her dinner was because she cooked some really good food. And in this picture, she's making something right here that some of you guys eat. Usually here we eat it on usually here we eat it on bread with jelly. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. She's making peanut butter. Uh, now in Molly, when I put peanut butter on bread, everyone went, whoa, what are you doing? That's crazy. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I'd smush a banana in there and they'd be like, oh yeah, what are you doing? And I'm like, that's good. And I'm eating my little sandwich. But in Molly, they use it in sauce on top of rice. They mix it with vegetables and they put it over rice. And you want to hear the word for it? Because in Mali they speak a different language. So they don't call it peanut sauce, because that's what we call it in English. In Mali they speak a language called Thongara. That's one of 33 different languages that's spoken there. And in Bangara you say Tigadigana. <laughs> which is really fun to say. Tigadigana. So Tiga means peanuts. Diga means to smush. And na is what you call sauce. So tiga diga na is smushed peanut sauce. <laughs> Yummy. And it was one of my favorite things to eat there. And the guy whose music I was playing in the beginning, his name is Chef Hamala Javate. And he actually lives in Washington, D.C. And when he comes to visit my house, which he usually comes once, once or twice a year, I have to make tiga diga na for him because he loves my tiga diga na. Next picture. Tiggity and So fun to say. Now, everybody in Mali works. Everybody. So even the kids work. These girls go back and forth to that well every day, all day long, collecting water for their family. Some of the kids have babies on their back. In the next picture, I think it's the next one. Yeah. You'll see this little girl right here, her name was Satu, and she has her baby sister on her back. These little kids came here with their older sisters because they're babysitting and washing the clothes. So all, all of the kids work, okay? Now the little teeny ones, three years old, probably don't have jobs. But once you turn five or six, you've got a job to do. There were two little boys in my village who were about six or seven years old, so a little bit younger than you guys, and they herded their family's um, cows and goats. So every morning, Sumaila and Muni would come by my house, and they have a big long stick and these big giant cows, and they'd be whacking the cow on the leg with the stick, taking them out to the fields to graze. Little, little teeny boys and great big giant cows. But that was their job, and that's what they were used to. Next one. There were only two boys in your village? No, there were lots of boys. Those were just two that had, had cows and goats to herd. Yeah. Now this, this um, child here, she's got three jobs that she's doing in this picture. First of all, she's babysitting her younger brother and sister. They're taking water in this container right here to their parents. And if you'll notice, the wheelbarrow is full right. of cotton. Oh. They harvest, they grow and harvest cotton in Mali. That's their cash crop. They get paid for cotton. And so this was the day the big truck came to gather up all the cotton in the village. So they had to get all of their cotton to one place so that it could be sorted and weighed. And so she was bringing cotton and kids and water <laughs> to her parents. So she's super busy. Next one. Now not very many people in Mali go to school. Not everybody gets to go to school like here. Wow. And if you go to school, you have to pay for it. Your parents have to pay. They also have to make sure you have shoes, shorts, and a shirt, a notebook, and a pencil. If you don't have one of those things, you can't go to school. Plus, you have to pay for it on top of that. So most people cannot go to school. In my village, when I lived there, 
there were only two boys that got to go to school. And they had to walk three miles to school, go to school, and three miles home every day. So there were only two that went to school. Now, when I was there in Mali, one of the projects that I worked on was trying to start a school in the village so that people could at least learn to read and write. And so this school actually didn't get started while I was there, but shortly after I left, they started holding their first classes. And so this is my friend Zamana. He was the first teacher in the school in Kokuto. Next picture. Now here are some ladies um, working. This is a main food crop that they eat in Mali called millet. Does anyone here feed the birds? No. Like in bird feeders at your house? No. Yeah, so you know the little, little teeny seeds that come in bird seed that the birds are like, nope, not gonna eat that, not gonna eat that, not gonna eat that. Yeah. That's millet. And that's what most people in Mali eat. They grow two different types, this bushy type that's up here, and then this stalky type that's down here. And if you look, the reason why it's up high, like this, is because there are lots of loose goats in the village. And if it's down on the ground, the goats are gonna eat it up. So a lot of times people stack stuff on um, elevated platforms like this to keep it safe from the goats and the cows and the chickens that are just roaming around. All right. Now one of the other projects that I worked on while I was there was um, a women's garden. There was a group of women that worked together and did different projects to raise money for, um, for their little group. And so one of the things they wanted to start was a garden. And so this is us working in our little garden. Next picture. Now, in Mali, people are subsistence farmers, which means everything they eat, they have to grow themselves. You don't go to the grocery store. There's no Safeway, Food Lion, Martins, Lidl. No doesn't exist. There's no Subway? They don't have grocery stores there. What they do have is open, our, open air markets like this one. And this was a market that was, I don't know, I could ride my bike there, not very far from my house. And this lady, I could go to her market and buy peanut butter, cucumbers, potatoes, hot peppers, onions, um, tomatoes, salt, and then this stuff is called um, sumbaya, it's a spice, and um, charcoal is the other thing that she's selling. And I could also buy oil and vinegar there, because people ate that on their salads. So um, sometimes I would go there and get bread. This is the meat counter behind her, so this guy was a butcher and he had meat there. But I didn't eat a whole lot of meat in Mali because they don't have refrigeration, so you can't keep things cold. So if I were somewhere and they were selling meat that had just been cooked, I could eat it. But as far as getting meat to fix at my house, I didn't do it because I didn't have electricity. And they don't eat a lot of meat in Mali. They mostly eat grains. It's because refrigeration. Now this group of um, guys, I did a lot of work with. Um, they had a group of um, about 14 um, guys that were all different ages, and they had all kinds of ideas of projects that they wanted to do. And so this one, we were clearing some space to, rate, um, to build some chicken houses, because we were gonna raise chickens. And it was interesting, when I first sat down with these guys and started talking to them about this project, I wanted them to sign an agreement saying what work they would do and work, what work I was responsible for. And we wanted to get it down so that everybody knew what their jobs were. And none of these guys could work. There were 14, 14 or 15 in my group. And of all of those people, age probably 20, the oldest guy I think was like 45, none of them could read or write. And I couldn't believe that. And so, and I mean, I knew in Mali that a lot of people don't go to school, but it just shocked me that these adults couldn't read or write. So we had literacy classes, and I taught all of these guys how to read and write their names, and how to write the alphabet in their language of Bambra, 
And by the end of my two years there, I would come home to my house, and sometimes I would have messages written in the dirt outside of my house. <laughs> and I would have to read to see who had come by to see me while I was gone. And this guy right here, Lastina, he got really good and was reading um, really well by the time I left. And then my friend Kotigi as well. Um, he was a really good student and did very well. So that was fun. That's what I knew I needed to be a teacher. Is that him? Now when you guys talk about ancient Mali, you'll talk about this word, specialization. And all specialization means is that a lot of times people have specific jobs, just like in the United States. We are teachers, right? You guys are students. Your parents might be a doctor or a lawyer or a tree person or a cab driver or somebody who works a nurse, something like that. So that just means you have a specialized job. You don't do a little bit of everything. You have a specialized job that you work. So these were two people that worked in my village that had a specialized job. This guy right here was the weaver in my village, and he's the one who made a lot of um, a lot of these things. He made this jacket. A friend of mine actually painted it, but he made it. And then he would weave cloth like this, and it would be super long. So in the morning, if I went by his house the cloth would only be to here. And in the afternoon when I came back, the cloth would be like all the way out to the trailers because he would weave and weave and weave all day and make long strips of cloth like this. And then he could sew them together and he's the one who made this blanket. He gave this to me before I left and you can see it's strips of cloth. And sometimes he put designs in it and sometimes it would just be plain. And this lady here, she made mud cloth in my village. And mud cloth, you'll see all over West Africa. They make it a lot of different places. And it's the thin strips of cloth. You can kind of see that better on the back. And then they paint designs on it with mud. And they dry it in the sun. And then I wash these things and they stay, you know, these colors. Now this one was actually made, these two were made in my village. Um, and the cool thing about these is my village, Kokojo, was known for um, producing honey. A lot of people kept honeybees and they raised um, honey, honeybees for honey. And so my village, the symbol that they used on the mud cloth represented my village, which was all about honey and honeybees. So down here at the bottom, you can see the bees, all these little spots of the bees. This is how they fly in a zigzag way. And then these are the little hives where they live. So if I wore this to the market, somebody would know that I lived in Kokujo. Now you'll notice, um, let's see. I have other ones, like this one. I don't know where this comes from. Sometimes they tell a story too. Um, you guys will also learn about griots, which are the storytellers in Mali. And so sometimes the mud clock tells a story um, that's like a legend and tells their history. But sometimes it just symbolizes where you're from in the, in the country. All right, next one. So there's the mud clock. So see, these are symbols that tell a story. And this may be the pattern of this specific um, artist, but all of the mud clocks depending on where you go, it's all different. All right, next one. This is my friend Seabury, um, which means Saturday, actually. His name meant Saturday. There was a Saturday, a Wednesday, and a Friday in my village. <laughs> um, but Seabury was really, really tall, like me. And so most people in Mali are kind of short. <laughs> but because Seabury was so tall, he called me his Dogumi, his little sister. And so um, I was really good friends with his family. And he was making a house because he had just recently um, gotten married. And so he was making bricks to build a house. How many of you guys live in a brick house? Like, Have you seen brick. a brick house? Like, I used to live yeah. in one. There are lots of brick houses in Virginia. Virginia. Oh. And in Mali, almost all of the houses are brick houses. 
Now they make them out of mud, which we make our bricks out of mud too. But the difference is the sun is so hot in Mali, you can bake them outside. So these bricks don't have to go in the oven. The bricks that we use to build our house have to go in the oven. All right, next one. Um, you guys will also learn about how trade happens and bargaining and how people don't really use money there. Somebody could make um, these little musical instruments and say I needed some gourds for, um, for water. I might trade and say, okay, I'll give you this if you give me three of these or something like that. So they, it's called bartering. So I have something that I make and I will trade it with you for something that you make. That's mostly how it goes. Um, and there are trade routes all over the place. And through the desert, um, when I went to Timbuktu, um, I walked out into the desert one night to watch the sunset, and there were camel caravans, guys like this, that are dressed up so that the sand can't get in their eyes or ears or mouth. They can cover their heads with a turban. And these long trains of camels, and the camels that stuff all on their backs, and they're going off into the desert to trade with different villages. Super cool. And I'm like, where are they going? Because it doesn't look like there's anything out there, but, but they're going all over the place. All right, next one. So one of the things the camel car caravans carried in ancient times, but they still carry today, is salt. Now, this says salt and gold, but gold is not traded on camel, camel backs anymore. <laughs> but salt still is. And they cut these huge blocks of salt from a mine in northern Mali um, from a place called Tuatani. And Tuatani actually was a salt mine 800 years ago in ancient Mali. And it still produces salt today. So they cut these big old blocks and they know that they can fit those blocks on either side of the camel. So these fit really well on the camels and that's why they cut them to that size. All right, next one. Now, music is a huge, huge, huge part of Malian life way back then and also today. And this was um, my friend Usman and he was a griot in a village not too far from mine. And he would have these big, crazy parties, and people would go and dance for three days. Ooh. And there's a book um, that is actually in my virtual classroom that you guys can read, all about Sunjata Keita, who was um, the, one of the first kings of the Malian Empire. And my friend Shek Kamala, whose music we were listening to in the beginning, and whose picture you'll see in a second, um, he tells the story of Sunjata Keita's life. And guess how long it takes him to tell it? If he tells the whole thing. Six hours. More. Four days. Three days. Three days, she's right. It takes three days to tell that whole story. So he would go to villages and they would have a three day long party. And my friend Shekamala would tell the story of Sunjata Keita. Crazy. All right, next picture. So when I lived there, um, my mom came to visit, which everyone was super, super excited about. And my mom was pretty stoked too because she had never traveled anywhere except for Bermuda, which is kind of like a resorty place to go. So she packed up her bags. One suitcase was full of stuff to make lasagna with too because that was my favorite thing to eat. So she brought lasagna fixings, which was amazing. But anyway, my mom came to visit and we had this big old party that lasted three days. And I had to cook and feed all these people who came to play music. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And they were super excited to see my mom. So next picture. Now this is my friend Shaq, who I've been talking a lot about. He was actually nominated for a Grammy Award. And when he went to the Grammys, he got to meet Beyonce. Amazing. Um, and he's, he's known all over the world. He's a super famous guy. And in the winter, he goes back to Mali because he hates the cold weather. <laughs> so he's in Mali now. He left, um, I think right before Christmas, he left this year. 
And this is his little brother, Kareem, who actually um, lives in D.C. And this is me and my husband, Sully, who's a teacher at Eastern View High School, and he plays Malian music. Um, but this was a program we did at Pearl Sample a long time ago. Next picture. So this is Sunjata Keita, who was the first king of the um, African Empire of Mali. And people called him the Lion King. So that whole, you know, la, 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 Lion King, it's his story. Whoa. Yeah, yeah we're pretty right cool. Here, we're so on my virtual classroom, there's a book about Sunjata that tells his history. So he's super, super interesting guy. All right, next one. And some of these books I put on my um, classroom, I think they're all on there, actually. So you guys can read all of these books. This guy right here, um, Baba Wage Jacate, he is um, an artist that lives in Oregon, but his grandma was a griot, and she told stories. So he's taken the stories that she told him when he was a little boy and turned them into books. So those are really cool stories. All right. I think that's it. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Okay. All right, sounds good. Woo! So now I have time for some questions if you guys have questions. Come out um, in the morning when they make the food, they make it in big pots like this, sometimes even bigger ones. Wait, how do they cook it? And they they bring the food out and they put it outside. Everybody lives outside mostly. You cook in your house and, and sometimes if it's cool enough, you sleep inside. But a lot of times, people even sleep outdoors because it's a lot cooler than being inside. So they would put the food out on the ground like that, and then all the little kids would come out, and this is what they looked like when they came out. And they would be all sleepy, and mom would say, it's time to eat, and they'd come out like this. And what they'd have on their head is their seat. This is a little stool to sit on and their spoon to eat. So let's say that mama has eight kids. Do you think eight kids could fit around that? Yeah, probably. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Because what they do is they put their side to the bowl. So you sit like this. And you put your side to the bowl and your legs out this way. And so all the kids sit all the way around the bowl, kind of like a sundial. And then you scoop up your food and eat. This. And then lunchtime, they don't even have to have a spoon because they eat with their hands. There would be sauce in the middle and either rice or these little patties made out of millet that they scoop up and eat with their hands. So that's how they eat. Okay. No questions? Usually I get about a million. Yes, Leonardo, you have another one. Why did I leave? Because as a Peace Corps volunteer, you can only stay for two years. And so I came home after two years. I would like to go, I would like to go back to visit. Um, I've only been back once since I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Yes, ma'am. This one, right here. So this um, is for a mean camel. So let's say you're on one of those camel caravans. And you've got a camel that likes to bite or spit, because sometimes camels can be really mean. So, I also have something else for him. So they put this on his face, so that um, he couldn't bite. So it's kind of like a, a halter, or no, is that what it's called? Yeah, a halter for a, um, or a muzzle for a camel. So that's what that is. And then the camels, um, they put this on them at night so that they um, don't they don't have anywhere to tie them up at night because there's no trees or anything in the desert. So they tie their their foot to one of their other feet so they can't run away. Um, but then they put this around them because they can move a little bit. So they sometimes will get a little way away from camp, but they put this really noisy bell on them. So that the herdsmen can find them. Yes, sir. This is another instrument. So this is called a 
Navarra. Um, in this country, you'll hear it called a shagere, but in Mali, they call it a bara. So you can play it like this, super loud, or you can play it like this. And you can sing. I'm not very musical, so there you go. And then these are musical instruments, too. My friend Shaq can do amazing things with this instrument, which I'm not making.